presentation on my end. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so the first, uh, so I'm, I'm Sid, I'm CEO of GitLab. Alex, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Alex Becker, and I am VP of Engineering at HackerOne. We met at a HackerOne event. It was an awesome event uh, um, in San Francisco on a Saturday. You, you guys distributed a whole lot of book bounties, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And in the margins, we, uh, we were talking about an interesting thing that we're doing at GitLab and an interesting thing Alex is doing at HackerOne. Um, the thing you were doing, um, Alex, is hiring with a pitch up front. And yep. I thought that was uh, super interesting. We're joined in, the, in this call by Barbie. She's the chief culture officer at uh, GitLab, Barbie. We'll, uh, we'll publish this uh, recording. And uh, Alex had something really interesting he, uh, he shared. So I'll let you, uh, uh, maybe you can describe what you do. Uh, are you talking about the hiring with the pitch up front topic? Yes. Okay. Um, so today at HackerOne, uh, well, first and foremost, our direct managers own all aspects of hiring into their team. Um, obviously, there's a number of ways that they can collaborate with either other managers or other functions, such as recruiting for various uh, support functions. But they own the recruiting process into their team. And uh, as you know, about half of our engineering team is in Groningen, uh, Netherlands, mm -hmm. where the market is, the talent market is fairly small. And so it was very difficult for us to hire uh, local candidates. And what we've done instead is we have uh, obtained a permit to sponsor uh, visas for people uh, coming from all over the world. And one of the challenges we ran into as a result was overcoming all sorts of uh, cultural biases and cultural barriers uh, for, for people to uh, agree to essentially uproot their entire life and move to a foreign country. And what we figured would work well and, and have shown to have worked well uh, for the nine months or so we've been doing this is we have uh, revamped our hiring process in addition to effectively interviewing people uh, half a world away, uh, starting off with pitching the opportunity by the direct manager themselves to the candidate to essentially up their level of excitement uh, to join HackerOne so that the conversion rate from the candidates we reach out to and who agree to interview with us, uh, that they persist through the entirety of the interview process and have a kind of strong belief that the HackerOne opportunity is the right one for them not just in terms of joining us as a company, but also essentially, you know, turning their entire life upside down and taking what is an enormous risk. Um, and, and so when I talk about cultural barriers, what I mean by that is a lot of the folks we hire tend to come from places that are much more conservative. And so they don't necessarily, you know, see relocating for work or leaving their family behind as either practical or even a possibility. And so we, we try to overcome things like that with getting them really excited about the opportunity to join HackerOne, which then ups the conversion rate for people to, to work through the interview process. And hopefully at the end of it, if both sides see a fit, um, that they agree to join us. That's really interesting. And how, what, what, is, what is your pitch like? Do you stress the fact that it's a product company instead of consulting or that it's a fast growing startup or the the do you pitch like where they emigrate to the the, the netherlands and, and what what new opportunities they get or do you pitch like pre people that have done it before and found it a good experience how, how do you pitch the opportunity uh, that's a great question it is uh, a mix of all of the above um really depends on the candidate we're talking to certain people we talk to have a lot of ambition. I mean, across the board, people who are even willing to consider the idea of uprooting their life and moving halfway across the world tend to come with a certain level of ambition. And so we try to tap into it by talking about all the great opportunities we offer at HackerOne. You know, the, the great thing about being a, a growing company is we do have a lot of opportunities for people to take advantage of uh, if they were to join the company. And, and that tends to feed into their own personal and career ambitions. So we really talk a lot about 
the growth of the company? What are some of the opportunities in front of us from a business standpoint, from an industry standpoint? Uh, talk about what we've been able to accomplish so far in our track record and then helping them understand how can they fit into that as well as talking about our, our culture, which kind of touches on the other topic that, that I know you want to discuss, which is the tying uh, or, or having a strong association between the work that engineers do and the business goals of the company. So the, you know, the, the positive business impact and really painting a picture for them that, you know, this is an opportunity for them to come in and really have that kind of an impact. Uh, this also works well with, uh, as an example, we hired a few engineers from uh, places in the world, uh, female engineers who come from places where, you know, it's not common for, for engineers to speak up in meetings. For example, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the cultural norm is directive comes from the top and you pretty much are just expected to follow orders and execute. And people get excited about the opportunity of joining a company where they can have a voice, they can assume more ownership. Um, and so all of that is also rolled into our, our pitch. Um, there are certain candidates who have, you know, uh, certain barriers to moving over that are unrelated to the, to the work itself. For example, folks with families and children. Um, we, we do a lot of uh, selling on, you know, how great a place of Groningen is. We actually have done quite a bit of research, especially more recently as we, we set out to hire more senior folks about, things like schooling and healthcare and all the other benefits to, to moving a family over. And so a lot of those selling conversations then tend to pivot to some of those sort of lifestyle conversations for folks who are considering uh, moving uh, to running in. So we really tend to tailor the pitch to what the situation is, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, obviously the hiring manager is, is a great person to give that pitch. Um, what do you think about, how do you feel about like an in-house uh, recruiter uh, giving that pitch? Someone that works at the company so they can speak with conviction about these, these things. So the way that I think about recruiting is, the nice thing about uh, where we are as a company today is we're small enough of a scale where, uh, small enough of a company size where scaling our hiring uh, isn't yet uh, a bottleneck. And so all of the engineering managers can really take the time to learn and understand hiring, which to me is essentially a conversion funnel. You know, at the bottom, you have people who show up on the first day. At the top are people that we identify to be potentially good candidates who we, we, we run outreach for and all the different layers in between. And I think I've counted probably 10 to 12 of them. And it gives an opportunity for managers to really understand what those layers are. Uh, in part because in the future, we expect them to, having understood the inner workings of them and um, how to optimize for them, that they can then subsequently operationalize them, meaning that they can distill certain important elements of each of the layers of hiring down to a set of instructions, for example, that they can then pass on to somebody else who can then execute it. So as an example, uh, a lot of our managers do their own sourcing. And in part is because it gives them an opportunity to both perfect their, their pitch as well as uh, learn how to effectively filter out uh, to find people that they. There's a, uh, in the future, my hope is that, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a, there was a bit of lag and I lost you at uh, how to filter out. Okay, so they, they get a sense of how to filter out to be able to find the people that they think could be good fits for their teams. And then in the future, the hope is that um, having all of that knowledge will allow them to then operationalize that, that layer of the hiring process and essentially create something that they can hand off to a recruiter, for example, to be able to execute on that and be as effective as them. So if they have, they have a great sense of what kind of messaging works with what kind of people they're looking to hire, whether it's skill set or seniority of part of the world, and uh, what what messaging resonates with people, and this comes into the now we're talking about the the focus that that or the emphasis that we put on, uh, either it's the company or the industry that we're in or the technical opportunities or whatever it is that initial sort of outreach topic, quote unquote, that they can then pass that on to recruiters. Uh, to be able to uh, execute on and be as effective at. And so now we're at this phase where we can do a lot of these things that don't scale. Longer term, 
we want to apply that knowledge to be able to operationalize each of the steps of the hiring process. Do you, and, and have you tried that yet, transferring something to a recruiter? Because what I have found, I think the model you're using is great in terms of, I think that uh, in addition to the benefits you've mentioned, my experience is also that many candidates would be much more responsive in having that conversation with the hiring manager than the recruiter that they feel they actually can have a good technical discussion, that they feel they actually can learn something from it, even if they don't take the job, um, and that they actually feel like they can get to know the actual team environment and management style. So I find that that helps as well. So have you found, have you tried to transfer that on to a recruiter and found that you've been able to succeed with it being just as effective, or have you found that there is some loss from that connection not being directly from the hiring manager? Um, I mean, there obviously is expected to be a loss um, because, as you said, people are more likely more willing and, and uh, excited about talking to a, to a direct hiring manager. Um, what I was referring to is, it w is specific to uh, sourcing, as an example, uh, which means that the, if, if, if we don't feel too confident about the conversion rate of passing on the, the sales call to a recruiter, we can still maintain that uh, or, or have that be owned by the direct hiring manager. Nice thing about it is because if each direct hiring manager is responsible for hiring into their own team, um, then it, it can scale a lot more versus sourcing tends to be a bottleneck a lot quicker. Um, so, so the sourcing part is, is try to auto to recruiters uh, more recently and, and have seen some initial early success with it. And I would say that the outcome of that was as good as, as a direct manager would, uh, would be able to pull off. And yet we still um, do all of the sales calling. Uh, and this is more specific to Groningen than San Francisco. We do still most of the sales calling by uh, the, the direct hiring manager. Obviously, you know, longer term across all the different steps of hiring, we'll have to be selective about what do we feel comfortable kind of scaling out horizontally, uh, depending on the kind of maintaining the conversion rate. Uh, but we haven't run into that, those problems yet. Cool. Uh, really interesting model. I don't have any further questions about this before we move on. Barbie, you, anything you want to ask or add? I see you shaking your head. Um, yeah. It's my understanding that you were interested in how we uh, make sure our engineers care about our business goals. Is that the case? or? Uh, I mean, th that was a back and forth discussion you and I had, and I think uh, you had some good ideas on it. Um, I shared our sort of methodology with you as well. So. Oh, um, I, f I forgot. I forgot what, that's w f what that was. Um, can you refresh my, uh, my mind? Uh, we talked about the at least from Hacker One's perspective, the importance of um, engineers caring about business goals and uh, essentially seeing the kind of the fruit of their labor, if you will, being uh, the or being tied to a positive impact on the business and not necessarily, you know, how, how technically complicated problem is that they're solving or the code that they're shipping to production or the features that they're shipping. It's really about the, the positive impact their work has on the overall success of the business. And yep. we, have, uh, we sort of built out a whole uh, ecosystem around it, um, including how we, how we hire, how we communicate to candidates, how we internally set compensation and uh, leveling uh, thresholds, uh, among other things. So how, how do you weave that into, for example, compensation? Do you, when, when kind of promoting someone, you, you look at how they impact the business goals or, or how do you do that? Yeah, so our, our, we have a, a leveling framework uh, that is entirely focused on level of impact. Um, so we don't, we explicitly exclude things like skill, whatever that means to people, um, you know, years of experience, age, what school they come from, what past companies they've been at, what degree they have, and focus exclusively on what positive impact have their, has their work had on the success of the business. And when uh, the promotion process works such that the direct manager uh, would draft a, essentially a proposal for promotion that describes that business impact and then we as a as an engineering management group 
uh, get together to to debate that. In the end, it is the decision is still up to the to the hiring manager or the the, the direct manager. However, the entire discussion is focused around the impact on the business. So we talked about, you know, these are the goals that we set out for ourselves. This is what we've been able to accomplish. This is what this person's role, uh, role or impact was to be able to accomplish those things. And then for each of the levels, we have certain definitions of what level of impact their work should have. And then over time, as more and more people get promoted, each one of those documents serves as essentially a, a, a you know, kind of a, a I like to think of it as a court of law system where you have the, the language of the law, but then you have every time it goes through challenge through court, there's like a data point, a proof point uh, to support that. And so over time, these, these levels and level of impacts that are associated with it are backed up by uh, historical uh, promotions in the documents that were written to support them as a kind of a, an example or representation of that level, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I'm looking at one of our uh, promotion documents and we do have like technical skill. And what we, for example, say is like, you have to be able to write modular, modular well-tested, maintainable code. And we link to kind of code they've written that proves that they, they possess that skill. And you could, yes, it's, it's a skill. On the other hand, it's like the, um, you look at the actual results they got, the actual code they wrote that, that proves that they have that. Now, we luckily also look at other things like leadership and, and code quality, communication, uh, performance. But I like your way of tying it even more to business goals. And it's something uh, we'll consider for sure. Yeah, well, one of the ways that we try to mitigate the risk of you know, people talk a lot about uh, 10x engineers and or ninjas or rock stars and whatnot, which we like to joke that are people who write a bunch of code and uh, get a bunch of credit for accomplishing certain things and then leave a ton of maintenance debt for the rest of their group to maintain as a result of that quote unquote velocity. Um, but we, we try to miss through our uh, rather than incorporating it into uh, into um, the, the, the promotional cycle and therefore it gives us an opportunity to kind of uh, simplify the promotional process where uh, the entirety of a, a promotion is based on the overall impact on the business and because it is squarely tied to the, to the goals of the company, that, that it is sort of independently verifiable. So anyone looking at the justification for, for the promotion can understand the, the reasoning for it because it is tied to company goals that we have all aligned behind as an organization. So it even goes beyond engineering. Yeah, yeah we, we don't hire rock stars. I just read something about Guns N' Roses and uh, they tend to show up late under the influence and trash the dressing room. So um, <laughs> we try to prevent those hires. Um, Although I love Guns N' Roses, just for the record. <laughs> I just say don't hire them as your develop in your development team. Absolutely, that's that's their point. Um, the, um, I, I think that's that's really interesting, and I think um, um, we tend to uh, we 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 try to tie it to results. Um, for example, when we give a bonus, and I think we can do it a bit better when we when we promote people. Um, so, so that's something we'll be looking at. Um, something else we discussed, maybe for the for the benefit of the viewer, because your memory is probably better than mine, but is is kind of making sure that there's alignment throughout the company what the business goals are, um, and what we do. For example, there is. Uh, our number one metric is incremental uh, uh, revenue that we get uh, on our subscriptions. And we have a monthly goal for that. And if we achieve that goal, everyone gets a free, uh, a free dinner um, to, to kind of celebrate that. And um, another thing we do is we make sure that there's clear objectives and key results that start from high three high level objectives for the whole company and that trickle down to all the different teams and those are public and and uh, those are made kind of bottoms up by the by the 
teams that have to have to make them while making sure they're aligned. Um, Barbie, do you have anything to to ask or add? Um, yeah, I would love to know how or or who is responsible for the team level OKRs that you mentioned that you derive from the company business goals. That's one of the things that we're setting out to do uh, right now as kind of a middle layer between the company goals um, and what the uh, the teams are working on day to day. Uh, and I'd be curious to know what the process is currently for you. Yeah, I'd be uh, I'd be happy to uh, to show you. Uh, if you Google GitLab OKRs, uh, you come to a page and you find all our uh, all our OKRs, and they start with uh, an objective. This is the objective, one of the three. Then some key results that are associated with that. Mm -hmm. And if you look at how that came together, um, it's all version controlled in Git. It won't surprise you at a company called GitLab. Um, and then you can see that there's a whole diverse set of people mm -hmm. that contributed to this. Like this is one of the last contributions from someone that recently joined uh, the company. And he, uh, he updated uh, the hiring ones. He updated like how we're doing so far, which is great. Um, and how do, you, how do you kind of formalize them? At what point do you rubber stamp it to say, this is what it is? Yeah, it's, they're never done. So they're always, they're always open to change. Um, if the companies, if the priorities shift, we change the OKR. So we won't be afraid to do that. Now, what we try to do is before the quarter starts, make sure that they're kind of up to snuff. And then sometimes the first few days of the quarter, they, they still move. And after that, there's, there's a significant drop off. But we will never like chase an objective that has become redundant because the world changed. Um, sure. And how do how did the individual contributors, the middle management, uh, the functional heads, um, how did they all fit into the process? Yeah. So they can kind of add their, um, make their own merge requests with proposals. So kind of, I cr I create the top three ones, and then all my reports start filling it out below that and then all their reports start filling it out below that. And then some of them do it in meetings and they submit it as bigger merge requests. But as we get more familiar with the process, I hope to um, kind of see more and more like team leads contributing. We used to do them to the individual level, but it wasn't very useful. So now we, we stop at the, at the team level because kind of the team is account, accountable uh, for reaching the objective. That makes sense. I'm, I'm, I'm of the same belief. Um, one, of the, one of the big benefits, uh, I believe, in uh, having uh, engineers and engineering teams be, work directly tied to the, uh, the, the business goals and the business outcome of the company, uh, one of the biggest benefits is it shifts perspective on the value of quote unquote shipping because getting something out into production in and of itself uh, doesn't provide much value to the company. It's really about the value that the customer derives from what was built, which in the end will sort of strongly correlate with the long-term success of the business. And so one of the benefits that we've seen in, in aligning engineering uh, teams behind operational goals is getting something out the door isn't I mean, it's, a, it's an important milestone uh, in and of itself is not the quote unquote desired outcome for us. And, and this is where some of our, our, our OKRs and, and important metrics come into play is uh, it, it is being referenced as what we call the success criteria. And that success criteria does not actually include shipping the thing. The thing shipping the thing is just a milestone. Um, and, and people kind of care beyond code being in production to extract as much value out of what we've built um, as we possibly can to help the business, you know, move the right metrics, essentially. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious to know how do you, how do you decouple sort of success or accomplishment, if you will, in an engineer's mind with getting code out to production, because that tends to be generally celebrated, especially as a company grows and scales and your overall scope of work is smaller and smaller percentage of, of the overall engineering function and what the company is trying to do. 
how do you how have you been able to decouple that if you will does that make sense yeah it makes a lot of sense um not sure we uh, uh we totally solved this uh, but one interesting thing we do is one of our values is to iterate so to ship very small updates and another thing in our strategy uh, we have a strategy called breath over depth and that means that when we do something we tend to kind of um, show where where it's heading and then do the minimal iteration the minimum viable change so right now we're in a phase where GitLab used to be version control now it's kind of the most important tools for the developers planning coding and testing that code but what we're doing now is we're going to go to a single application for the whole DevOps life cycle. So the, all these operations tasks come with it, packaging, releasing, configuring, and monitoring what you make. And that's a whole lot of scope, and we're adding that in a single year to the product. Now, that's, that's a really high pace. Um, so on one hand, we're, we're telling people, like or to, uh, our developers are creating that entire scope, but they're doing it with, with a very minimal first implementation. And after that, kind of, we, we, we get those small pieces out the door and then we kind of wait for, for feedback. We, we have open issue trackers and then customers will tell us, hey, I would like this. And sometimes it's users, sometimes it's customers. Uh, many times it's like, for example, salespeople commenting in the issue tracker. I have a customer with 300 people. Here's the Salesforce link. And they want, they want to see this because X, Y, Z. And then it's up to the product managers to kind of prioritize things that people are, uh, are waiting for. So if we're beyond like the, the initial showing the direction and we're kind of filling, in, f filling it in, um, almost always that's based on, on kind of customer and user uh, requests. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I guess a related question on the OKR front how do you determine what metrics matter from a, a sort of the perspective of being able to influence them? So kind of distinguish, distinguishing key results from KPIs, how do you determine which of the key results actually matter for, for the engineering team to be able to move? Ooh, I'm not sure there's a, I have a, a cookie cutter answer for, answer for that. It's always it's always kind of hard to to set uh, set those key results. Um, we try to we try really hard to 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 pick something that makes sense and that's quantifiable and that's that's hard to game um, and that will really move the business forward. Um, but it's it's always hard to pick the, the exact metrics. Um, is there? I'm not sure, like, I think for, it's a great question, though. I, th I think it's, yeah. a, it's a great question and consideration, Alex, and I think it's something we can actually get better at. Yeah, because that's one of the things that I always personally struggle with is you know, picking the right target. And uh, in, in our world, one of the challenges that we have is, you know, hacker-powered security is not an established industry. So we're, you know, to be extreme, are kind of on the polar opposite of building a better mousetrap. And so as a result, there aren't a lot of kind of standard practices for what it means to build a hacker powered uh, security platform. And, and as a result, there are not a lot of kind of acceptable. Uh, a bit of our. You know, for kind of a consumer e-commerce space, you know, best practices that we that would be a little easier for us to, to get up to speed on. But in our case, it's not unusual for us to care about certain metrics that wind up being not as important as we originally believed them to be. We're constantly trying to iterate on the process and get better at it. But as one of our, one of our main struggles is when we try to set these success criteria is not always straightforward to figure out what exactly we're trying to shoot for. Yeah, it's, I, I think Hands that's... That's a hard thing. And by the way, your audio is sometimes a bit lagging. I, th I think you're in it's your internet connection. Um, but uh, what they, uh, if if I look at your market, it's kind of, 
it's a, it's a two-sided marketplace. Uh, what they told us at Y Combinator, what to look for in a two-sided marketplace is, is number of messages kind of exchanged. So kind of number of messages going between the hackers and uh, the companies paying, um, that, that should probably be one of your key performance indicators. Hmm. Is there any, do you know of any good documentation, say from Y Combinator that talks about this? Uh, no, I don't. Yeah. I can, I can try okay. to look, it's not my, um, it's not my metric. I can try to imagine why, for example, you can also look at revenue and I'm sure you're doing that. And that's, <laughs> that's a really good metric and I'm, I'm sure you're already looking at it. But, uh, for example, if, if there's not for profits, which hackers hack for free, like that's still a contribution. Uh, you could also look at like number of cases opened and closed, but if there's little interaction between the two parties, it's kind of a warning sign that something is kind of going wrong on your platform. It's becoming less of like a community. It's becoming very transactional. It's becoming easier to uh, disrupt. So the, the number of messages is kind of a, an engagement and of course, the, the more programs, the more hackers, et cetera, then automatically uh, me messages will go up as well. So it's, you're able to, to measure both programs, mess, uh, matches, uh, hackers, and engagement, all with one core metric. Hmm. Yeah, well, our, one of our challenges around engagement, which is kind of a more non-traditional to uh, two-sided marketplace, is the fact that Hackers could be engaged with customer programs without the customer program ever knowing about it. Hackers could find a program that they like and spend a bunch of time hacking on it and not necessarily finding anything and therefore there's not much to report. And the company as a result never actually knows about it even though there was engagement um, from the hacker standpoint. And therefore uh, when we talk about engagement uh, there, there's definitely the, the more obvious metrics around, you know, report submissions and things like that, that we, we actively measure and care about. Uh, but those tend to be more, as, as I like to think about outcomes uh, of engagement and not directly uh, correlated to engage, or it is correlated, but not a direct representation of engagement. Um, we have certain, certain uh, customers who run very competitive bounty programs, uh, bug bounty programs on our platform, would draw a lot of engagement, not necessarily producing a lot of submissions. And it's sort of a high risk, high reward uh, for a hacker to engage in, a, in, a, in, in trying to, to hack a program with uh, uh, high payouts because the company expects the submissions to be few and far between, but a lot of hackers trying. And so in those scenarios, it's, it's a little harder for us to pin down engagement for for uh, for any given program, uh, based on the the its attractiveness, its payout, and a lot of other criteria that we don't have visibility on the effect of uh, for a hacker community, if that makes sense. Yeah, I I, I see the problem, and hey, when you when you kind of have legacy vendors, they give you a nice report, even though they didn't find anything, they give you that nice report with zero vulnerabilities that you can send to your uh, to your customers. In this yep. case, it's, it's harder, and I'm sure you thought about different ways to kind of capture the attention that the hackers do via their log files, via their connections, yeah. and, and all the other things. But I, I see the problem. I don't see, an, uh, I don't see a big uh, solution. Um, maybe one way I could see is maybe connect those hackers together to kind of, if, if there's like a forum environment, like what have you tried? What have you tried? Like I've tried this, but it's not working. Like you can see kind of activity that way. But I also know that in that community, it's much less common to kind of collaborate and share your methods uh, than uh, in some other communities I've, I've encountered. So that might be a challenge there. Yeah. And one of my, uh, one of my, one of the outcomes I wanted to produce as part of, uh, effectively setting success criteria is more around setting on a on a, an effective methodology or a system to be able to determine valid uh, key results and you know I, I expect that again given the kind of complexity and, and lack of a uh, an existing space to give us guidance that a lot of our uh, 
a lot of our metrics that we come up with will be somewhat good approximations, not necessarily as, as ideal as we would like them to be, as long as we have some system to both uh, set them consistently enough so that we are at least trending in the right direction, but also that we can iterate and improve on the process over time and then being able to scale it out across the entire function so that as we grow and scale that uh, each of the teams can, can effectively set their own uh, key results uh, following this methodology. And hopefully over time, we can get to a place where the outcomes of those processes are effective key results that we can all get after, which is what the, the ideal outcome that we're looking for. Yeah. One, one thing that uh, we, we looked, at, looked at a lot of metrics to kind of look at the effectiveness of development teams. Like we, we make software for development and operations uh, people. So like how do you measure their effectiveness? And that's, uh, there's a, long of, a lot of wrong ways to measure it, like lines of code written and, and metrics like that. And even things like velocity points and, and things like that don't really make sense. One thing that's very telling and very hard, much harder to game is uh, cycle time. So our premise now is that GitLab can uh, make your DevOps cycle 200% faster. Um, that, and that is what is like the time between deciding to do something and seeing the results of that back in revenue or engagement or, or user happiness. Um, and we think that's a, a very important metric. And I'm seeing more and more on the internet when people talk about the security profile of certain companies that they talk about their response time, how fast they're able to respond to something. And I know that HackerOne is, is, is very much trying to help companies to do better there and, and to drive them towards that. Um, in, in the future, maybe if you like look at like how secure is a company, Maybe you look at like what bug bounty, how high are the bug bounties they're awarding, how fast do they respond, and then maybe an indicator of how fair they are in, uh, in communicating and, and awarding those bounties. But of those three, I think the response time is becoming uh, the defining metric. It's easy to measure, it's fair to measure. And uh, yeah, in our business, all the companies are becoming software companies and how fast they can respond is, is the definition. And it's kind of the difference between if you, if you look at a very effective, fast moving startup and an old company uh, that hasn't undergone a digital transformation yet, most of the time you'll find that they had, it's cost months to get some change out the door. And every, Every like week they can save there, they get closer to having motivated people and, and to, to being able to follow the rapid changes in the, in the marketplace. I would actually love to hear when you mentioned that um, the value you provide to customers is, uh, uh, you mentioned 200% increase in velocity? Yeah, 200% faster DevOps cycle. Um, so where it used to take you say six weeks, now it takes you uh, two weeks between deciding to do something and and seeing the results. So how do you how do you help customers track that? Because that's one of the other things that we always wrestle with is how do you showcase an objective measure of value from yeah. the software we provide. So there's a functionality in GitLab called Cycle Analytics, and in it you get the results like on how fast your your project is going. And what we, uh, what we intend to do is graph that and set it out against another thing, the DevOps score, how much of GitLab you've embraced. And our thesis is that the more of GitLab they embrace, the faster they can ship. Um, and that's the and data that, points we're starting to collecting. And uh, the, the cycle analytics and the DevOps score, is that a proprietary score that you've assembled or is it based on some, you know, more uh, kind of, fundamental first principle like data such as time between x and y yeah so the cycle analytics output just a time so it's just the average or mean time between saying yes we're going to do this and and when did uh, when did you actually deploy the code and start collecting metrics so that's kind of unambiguous um the devops score is more a score like GitLab consists of like 10 major parts which parts of those are is your project using to what effect and then uh, put a percentage on that. Gotcha. Okay. That's very interesting. 
I think that that's something that we could we could definitely do. Um, that's awesome. I, I took them some notes. I'm going to do some yeah. digging around there. The, the idea market. between that is that within a bigger organization, I'm not sure you have the same thing, but in a bigger organization, there's multiple projects going on. And if you can show that the projects that are, are more embracing your product have better results, uh, then there's a case for the, the leadership to say, okay, well, everyone's got to start embracing it. If you I, show that, that like the divisions using Hacker One can respond faster to bugs, then they might mandate it across the company. And for your cycle analytics, um, what scope uh, do you consider, uh, at what scope do you consider something to be a project that's worth tracking the cycle of, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so everything that is a project in GitLab and everything that has a separate code repository is a project in GitLab. And then we measure the time between kind of creating an issue for it and scheduling it and, and, and reviewing it and rolling it out to production. Got it. Okay. And just for me to get a sense of that scope, um, what is a, a, a good uh, cycle, average cycle duration, if you will? <laughs> um, is there, is there some kind of standard that kind of independently verifiable across various organizations or is it sort of no, kind of like point velocity really dependent? I, I think a young startup is shipping in less than a week. Uh, we're shipping now kind of every month and there's a, a, a bunch load of companies that shipping every quarter that takes a quarter to, to get something out the door. Okay. Gotcha. That makes sense. That's really helpful. Um, I would love to, to check out some of the marketing material for it because I think there's a lot we can learn from that. Cool. I'll send it to you. And you can also Google GitLab Cycle Analytics. Fantastic. I took down some notes. That's really valuable. Cool. All well, right. Those are all the questions I had on my end. Yeah, for me too. Right. Barbie? No, I'm good. This was interesting to see how you're doing things there, Alex. I appreciate your time. Likewise. Thanks so much for, uh, for getting on a call. Thanks, Alex. Right. Take care. Bye.